Hello, uh, in this mind map, we're going to concentrate solely on breast neoplasms or breast tumours. And this will include both pre-malignant as well as malignant and benign conditions. So um, again, let's quickly recap uh, the histology of the breast. Here we have an example of a large duct with some lobules coming out of it. Um, this circled area constitutes the terminal duct lobular unit and this is uh, the source of many of the epithelial neoplasms of the breast including benign and uh, malignant tumours. And here of course we have the large duct. There are also neoplasms that can arise from here. A good example is an intraduct papilloma. The pinkish stroma here just surrounding the lobules is known as the intralobular stroma and this is important because it is the source of the fibroepithelial tumors in the breast which we'll talk about later and then we just have the non-specialized interlobular stroma between the lobules and this uh, comprises fibrous tissue adipose tissue and blood vessels so you can imagine think of some of the tumors that can arise from the interlobular stroma now when it comes to breast neoplasms, we always uh, divide them into benign and malignant tumours. So let's start looking at them systematically depending on what they arise from. And we're going to start off by looking at epithelial tumours. So think of the large ducts as well as the TDLU. Uh, among the benign tumours, there is a common one that arises uh, within the large ducts and uh, these are called intraduct papillomas or large duct papillomas or simply just papilloma and this is an example taken from robbins uh, you can see that there is actually a dilated ductal structure and uh, papillary architecture that still maintains the bilayered epithelium and this helps us to see that it is benign now very very importantly there are some malignant tumors and these do arise usually from the tdlu and for this, we want to divide them into prognostically important groups. So I think the two main groups would be in situ versus invasive. So for in situ, we have ductal carcinoma in situ. And here is an example. Uh, again, this is taken from Robbins. And what you notice is that they are very rounded. This is because they are existing lobular and ductal structures. So they are <clears throat> they're actually expanded by sheets of these neoplastic cells. And if you look carefully, you can see that within each individual expanded lobule uh, or duct, there's this pink area and this is necrosis. We call this comedo necrosis because it's sort of in the center of this island. And there's some purpley areas here which represent calcifications. Um, these are dystrophic calcifications from necrotic tissue. And this correlates very nicely with the mammographic picture. This is a picture taken from Robbins. You can see these linear calcifications that occur sort of in a row. And typically, calcifications like these would be quite worrying for DCIS. We would see linear or branching calcifications. And this would probably be uh, picked up during screening and be an indication for biopsy of the breast. In addition to DCIS, there is also, of course, LCIS. That's lobular carcinoma in situ. So DCIS and LCIS are slightly different in terms of clinical significance. For DCIS, we are worried that uh, the DCIS itself may progress to invasive carcinoma, so we want to excise the whole area. For LCIS, this is more of a marker of risk of malignancy. So there is a risk of malignancy not only in the same area, but in a different area in the same breast and even in the contralateral breast. So for both DCIS and LCIS, uh, even though the context is slightly different, there is a significantly increased risk of malignancy of 8 to 10 times. Compare this with atypical ductal lobular hyperplasia that we talked about and uh, proliferative breast disorders without atypia. Now the next thing we want to talk about is all important invasive breast malignancies. So ductal carcinoma, lobular carcinoma, these two will be the main uh, histological types and then there are some special types which uh, you can find in your textbooks and your lecture notes. The commonest type of breast carcinoma is ductal carcinoma and later I'll briefly mention how do we actually prognosticate this. Of course these are already invasive so they are able to invade locally into adjacent structures such as the skin as well as the chest wall. They can also go into lymphatics and blood vessels and spread to axillary lymph nodes um, and also distant sites. 
Now let's move on to the next um, category or the next tissue of origin. And these are fibroepithelial tumors. They're sometimes called biphasic tumors. These arise from the intralobular stroma, specialized stroma around the lobules. And they're often composed of both epithelial as well as stromal elements. It is really the stromal elements that are neoplastic. So, of course, the most famous benign one is the fibroadenoma. And we have also the phyllodes tumor, which is similar but not the same. Here is an example of a gross um, specimen of a fibroadenoma. This particular case, you can see, is quite lobulated. It's very, very well circumscribed, so much so that it's quite obvious that the surgeon has actually shelled it out from the surrounding tissue. Sometimes the surface is more smooth, and this is often very firm, and uh, it is called the breast mouse because clinically it is very mobile. So this is a classical appearance of a fibroadenoma grossly. And on microscopy, we have a clearly biphasic tumor. Uh, there is this pink stroma, which is the fibro component of the name. And then we have these slit-like uh, compressed ductal structures, which is the adenoma component, hence fibroadenoma. And these are most of the time benign. Now, the phyllodes tumor is another example of a fibroepithelial tumor. And I've just got a very small picture here. It's called phyllodes because it's sort of got a leaf-like architecture. And what you're seeing is the stroma, again, predominant component, the pink stroma, that sort of pushes against the epithelial component, causing this leaf-like folds. And phyllodes tumor can sometimes be malignant. Um, the malignant component is the stromal component most of the time. Uh, hence, we see that this tumor actually arises from the intralobular stroma. So moving on, uh, the next main category would be the interlobular stroma, where we can see fatty tissue, fibrous tissue, as well as blood vessels. And an example of a benign neoplasm is a lipoma. And an uh, example of malignant tumor would be angiosarcoma, so a malignant tumor of the blood vessels. This can sometimes be secondary to radiation. If the patient is being treated with radiation to the chest area, say for another malignancy, um, they can develop a secondary angiosarcoma. Uh, the last category is just others, and I just want to mention one particular primary tumor which can occur in the breast, and this is the lymphoma. Most of the time, these are non-Hodgkin uh, B cell lymphomas. Now, uh, we want to just briefly look at some of the risk factors that are associated with uh, breast cancer. And uh, I will not go into details, just mention them here so that you can supplement them from your notes or from your textbooks. They include age, race, um, hormonal exposure is also important. For example, early age at Minaki confers a higher risk. At the same time, um, hormone replacement therapy can also confer some degree of risk. And um, pre-existing breast disease is very important. This is something that we talked about in the earlier mind map. If we have proliferative lesions, particularly with atypia, uh, these confer a significant risk of developing breast cancer. Um, hormone replacement therapy we briefly touched on earlier. And family history is also important. We know that there are some tumor suppressor genes, such as BRCA1 and 2, that can give rise to familial breast cancer. And not only breast cancer, but other types of cancer as well. And finally, obesity also confers some degree of risk. Uh, now, how do we prognosticate breast cancer? Meaning, how do we tell uh, how the patient will do? Um, so, in essence, we have to look at quite a few factors together. And this, uh, these include the grade of the tumor, which is assessed microscopically, the stage of the tumor, which we use the AJCC T and M staging system. Uh, this is assessed locally. Um, on microscopy by the pathologist, as well as um, in terms of the more distant uh, organ systems, it's assessed radiologically. We also want to look at the histologic type of the tumor. Certain types confer better prognosis, for example, uh, lobular carcinoma, tubular carcinoma, whereas if it is just ductal carcinoma or carcinoma of no special type, it's not so good. And another important um, prognostic or predictive a uh, parameter would be the hormone receptor status and the HER2 status. So ERPR would uh, predict the response to hormonal treatment 
And HER2 new is an interesting marker because it is both prognostic as well as predictive. Prognostically, it usually confers a worse prognosis. However, uh, it predicts response of the tumor to her septin treatment. So this is both prognostic and predictive. So pathological examination is key to prognostic, uh, prognosticating tumors in terms of grade, stage, histologic type, as well as predictive uh, Factors. We also want to look at lymphovascular invasion, which I didn't mention earlier, which is also examined under the microscope.